O oh God, make haste to deliver me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you called light into being, and you set lights in the sky to govern night and day, in a pillar of cloud by day, in a pillar of fire by night, you led your people into freedom, enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ, may your word be a lamp to our feet, and a light to our path. 
For you are merciful, and you love your whole creation, and with all your creatures we give you glory, through your Son, Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever.
reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When a great crowd gathered and people from town after town came to him, Jesus said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell on the path and was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered for lack of moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. Some fell into good soil, and when it grew, it produced a hundredfold. As Jesus said this, he called out, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. Then his disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said to you, It has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to others I speak in parables, so that looking they may not perceive, and listening they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, the ones on the path are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root, they believe only for a while, and in a time of testing fall away. As for what fell among the thorns, these are the ones who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. But as for those, as for that in the good soil, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear with fruit, with patient endurance. The Gospel of the Lord. Good evening, my name is Tim Wiseman, and I serve as pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of the Holy Trinity in the city of New York. And please know whether you've been to Bach Vespers at Holy Trinity a thousand times, or this evening marks your first time experiencing this music in this place, whether in person or online, there will always be a place for you here. In June of 1934, the annual convention of the Michigan District of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod was held in the small town of Frankenmuth, Michigan, 15 miles southeast of Saginaw. For those of you wondering if I'm familiar with the whole Michigan Mitten analogy, it's right about here. Not surprisingly, most of these people who go to these things are pastors. And one of the attendees of the convention that year was a pastor by the name of Christian Riedel, the pastor of Emmaus Lutheran Church in Detroit. Having come all the way up to Frankenmuth from the big city and proving that Lutherans are generally too cheap to get a hotel room, Riedel stayed with his cousin, a guy by the name of Leonard Reichla. And as the story goes, it was after dinner one evening, after a long day of Lutheran mayhem, when Pastor Riedel and his cousin, sharing the news of the day while sipping an extra dry martini, gin of course, that Leonard pulls out an old Bible from his cabinet. Now, as a pastor, let me tell you that people just love to show pastors their Bibles. I have no idea why. And this is a perfect example. 
Leonard tells his pastor cousin that this Bible is special not only because it's in German, and Lutherans love things in German, but because his dad purchased it from a bookseller in Philadelphia some 100 years earlier. In the late 1830s, right after he'd immigrated to America and right before he'd moved to Michigan to make wagons. Pastor Riedel expressed interest, whether feigned or not, but once that door was cracked, Leonard immediately went up to the attic to find the other two volumes. Turns out that this Bible was a three-volume set that contained both translations and commentary by Martin Luther, okay, that's cool, but with additional commentary by a theology professor in Wittenberg by the name of Abraham Colovius. But that's not all that Pastor Riedel noticed. Each of the three volumes of this crusty old German Bible had a signature on the title page. A rather distinct signature, if you've ever seen it. And while I'm not sure whether Pastor Riedel said anything to his cousin that evening, what would be confirmed some 30 years later through both handwriting analyses and carbon dating of the ink was that signature in those three volumes picked up at a bookseller in Philadelphia belonged to Johann Sebastian Bach. It's called the Kalov Bible. And since being discovered in an attic in Frankenmuth, Michigan, and no, I'm not making any of this up, Bach's Bible is now an asset of Concordia Seminary Library in St. Louis, Missouri. Why any of this matters for Bach's scholarship is that these three volumes contain some 348 underlinings and marginalia in Bach's own handwriting. And this might be my favorite part. With many of his notes, Bach was correcting typos and grammar. Perhaps the most famous example, though, of Bach's comments in the Kalov Bible is found in the margins of 1 Chronicles 25, in which the chronicler lists the prophets and musicians set apart by King David. Translated into English, Bach writes, this chapter is the true foundation of all church music that is pleasing to God. Another fascinating example is in the margins of the Song of Miriam in Exodus 15 where Bach himself writes, Erstes Vorspiel auf zwei Choren zu Ere Gottes du Musikzieren. First prelude for two choirs to be performed to the glory of God. A reference to Bach's motet set to those verses, BWV 225. But I have to admit that out of all 348 underlinings and marginalia in the Kalav Bible, the one I'm most interested in this evening is the one box scrawled next to the gospel reading you just heard. After all, we can know that Johannes was particularly acquainted with the parable of the sower, as it's called, given the fact that he'd written three cantatas on it, including the one you're about to hear. Leichtgesinnte Flattergeister. Let's attempt to translate, shall we? Insincere and fickle spirits, simple-minded and fickle souls, scatterbrained frivolous people, light-minded frivolous spirits, my personal favorite, frivolous flitterty gibbets, or more colloquially, a silly goose or a dirty rascal. However we translate them, these first two words of this cantata on the parable of the sower, paired with all its fluttering trills and angular figures, to which we can add the surprising details that the first movement isn't the customary chorus, but an aria, and the final movement is not a chorale, but a chorus, all betray the composer's playfulness in spite of the fact that this is a deeply unplayful parable. 
After all, if we take Luke's metaphor at face value, while some of us are seeds that are going to bear lots of good fruit, far too many of the rest of us, Luke says, are either going to get trampled on, eaten up by predators, choked by thorns, or simply left to wither and die. Which is perhaps why Johann Sebastian Bach wrote what he did in the margins of the Kalev Bible. For what is this world? Bach scrawled next to the parable of the sower, but Dornan, that is, but thorns. For what is this world but a thicket of thorns, Bach continues, that we must tear ourselves through? And indeed, indeed, by the time Johann Sebastian Bach scrawled those words into the Kalev Bible sometime around 1733, he'd been orphaned at age 10. He'd survived his childhood and adolescence, despite regularly recurring outbreaks of the plague and high childhood mortality. He'd endured a nearly constant pressure to produce more and more and more music from court officials to town superintendents to clergy, especially in Leipzig. And he not only suffered the death of his first wife, but ten of his infant children. So yes, Bach's life was actually a thicket of thorns. Two years into global pandemic, in which we'll never know what the next variant will bring, in which people are still dying of cancer, in which New York City is nearly guaranteed to flood more this summer than it did last. Hashtag climate change. In which the United States Justice Department still won't prosecute those who tried to bring down our democracy. You might say we're in a thicket of thorns, too. Which is all to say that we are at risk of the kind of Felsenherzen, the same kind of hardness of heart that is going to get us trampled on eaten up by predators and choked by those thorns. So another one bites the dust. But what Luke knows, that Jesus knows, that God knows, that Johann Sebastian Bach can certainly teach us, that the alto is going to sing, thanks Kate, is that Christ's word has the power, das Felsen selbst der Springen, to split open rock. And just like an angel's hand moved the rock away from the tomb of Jesus, and Moses, with his staff aus einem Berge Wasser bringen, could get water from a rock. While the changes and chances of the world certainly have the capacity to harden our hearts, the calcification of our soul need never be so permanently rigid. And you know how I know it? It's because Johann Sebastian Bach took the most deeply unplayful parable and still wrote the cantata you're about to hear. With its fluttering trills, lively melodies, and unexpected forms. And that same spirit that refused to allow Bach's heart to harden to the point he couldn't write joy, well, that same spirit moves through you now. 
Hopefully you're refusing to ever let any of us become frivolous liberty givens ourselves. Especially when we have so much access to God's grace, joy, and love. Sometimes you just have to look in the margins. And all God's people said, Amen.
Good evening. I'm Diane Meredith Belcher, Director of Music here at Holy Trinity Church and Director of the Bach Vespers Ministry. I say ministry because this is a series that is offered for free uh, to provide inspiration and comfort and joy. We invite you uh, to give generously uh, using one of the options found on the screen to help support this ministry. Thank you so much.
us pray. O God, the strength of all who put their trust in you, mercifully grant that by your power we may be defended against all adversity. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.